All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, next up, we've got Jim Ropel. Obviously, you know him from as on Twitter as Uptick. Aptigan, and uh, we'll talk about really whatever you guys want to talk about today. It's a live Q&A. Um, Jim's got some charts to show about economic data that he says is going to blow our minds, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, and we're going to get into some, some charts, some strategies, all that. I know a lot of you have questions about hedging, uh, so we'll take a look at that as well and, and, and pick Jim's brain on that. So to uh, start things off, Jim, did you want to start with those charts and, and, and talk us through what you're, what you're looking at? I do, and um, it, there's also between... I'm going to show you charts that are going to statistically graph wise prove to you the economy is raging, 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 but that may not necessarily correlate into what the market's going to do in the near, in the future. We may have already discounted all these charts I'm about to show you, but to put it in perspective, um, my daughter went to the Cubs cards game the other night. It was the first game where they had a 100% occupancy. It was a rager beyond ragers. Like it, it was a game for, you know, Cubs cards, first game opening and the city of Chicago just went nuclear. And this is going, I think this is a reflection of people being bottled up. And so I'm just gonna fly over here and try and share my screen really quick. Go for it. And uh, we're gonna skip trade desk right now, but let's just, come on Wanda, let's go. I'll show you how I hedged with options on Trade Desk. See that spinning circle? This is not what I want to see right now. No problem. Um, I can share my screen if, if, or we can we can start with. Oh, there it goes. This was working just one second ago. Uh, that's all. That's always how it goes. It's it's no right. problem. We don't. I'm going to reload it. Yep, no problem. Um, Okay, and uh, while we're waiting, everybody, if you have any questions whatsoever that you'd like to hear Jim's response to, uh, leave them down below in the chat. And if you're enjoying the stream so far, go ahead and let, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. We've got some great content uh, planned. Um, and also go ahead and check out um, the links in the description. We've got a sale going on for Leadership Blueprints right now. Um, really great um, course here that we worked for months on. So go ahead and check that out in the description. And um, yeah, really great rest of the day plan with some top speakers. Um, and Jim, did you want to get started with some other questions and see if that works later or, or do you want oh, to keep trying? Why don't we try one question while one's loading? Sure, at a, sure. At a turtle's pace. Yeah, no problem. Um, so let's see. Let's see what we've got here. Um, so first of all, at what point are hedging decisions made? Maybe we can talk about that later um, because we're going to be talking about headphones. But here's a good one from Sean. Um, Jim, what concepts did Lee Freestone go over with you when he was mentoring you? One thing that really, really stands out is he's like, Jim, you get a graph and you go bar by bar by bar and you just look at, is it supportive? Is it accumulation? Is it distribution? And you just go through that whole base. And it, if you take the time to study it, it really tells you a story. Yeah. And you can see periods where Stocks may have been under significant inst institutional accumulation, like when, when Goldman Sachs was buying it. And then six months later, you might realize Fidelity has been buying and these whales are building these positions and it hasn't really started to go yet, but you can see these big globs of accumulation, uh, which give you big clues. And I mean, he taught me a lot. I, I, yeah. I he was good to me. <laughs> when you used to call O'Neill and company like 20 years ago, when you wanted uh, help, they would send you to Lee who ended up being one of the greatest traders in the world. And all you had to do was pick up the phone and call IBD and he would answer your call. That's and awesome. Your That's so, awesome. Um, hold on one second. Okay, Wanda is up. Sure. And now Go I'm ahead and share. integer and I'm going to save lists. First of all, I'll bring you on here. Share screen. Share and preset lists and economic indicators, general economic indicators. And the first one I want to look at is, I'm sorry, I want to, oh. I got to tell you, oh, here we, it's starting to, Wanda has never done this before. I mean, no, no problem, no problem. Let's fire another question while we wait. Yeah, sure. Um, we've got some great ones here. So first of all, this is something that I know you're great at. Did it just come up? It tried. It's tried. Um, 
we, we just went through a very choppy passion growth and all of that. Uh, but right now we're seeing a lot of leaders start to emerge. So I guess the, the main question I have is how do you spot those leaders and how do you focus on and, and look and identify them early so you can catch those moves? Okay, this was so much easier when Bill used to put out chart books because you could go from A to Z and you could see bottoms forming in groups where they were nowhere near viable, but you go, oh my gosh, they, these, these groups are all starting to uh, get support and start to turn up. Mm -hmm. And so you had like screening now, you need like a, maybe a shorter term relative strength line to identify the, that it's turning up. But, you know, Bill also, can slim seems to be so predicated on earnings and it is but if i think bill was here he would say to us the new high list is your gold bar list because there's a lot of time there are occasions like now when you have mining issues and gold and oil yeah. are banging new highs and look really 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 good but the earnings just aren't there it's kind of a group move based on commodity prices and the opening up of the economy so the new high list i i think i say this a lot if a stock is going to go from 30 to 300, it has to make a new high all the way. It's going to be there. Like it, it's, it's the listing here, here they are. Here's all these game changers. So watch that new high list. Perfect. And uh, here we've got a great one. Um, hi, Jim. How do you deal with drawdowns psychologically when dealing with such a large portfolio? Do you stick with your sell rules? Thank you. I've altered my style a great deal from when I ran just my money or when I was a retail broker, I had many, many segregated accounts. And so the volatility up and down, certain people could handle. And now I have to deal with personalities of whale hunters and people who just want, you know, a really good sharp ratio. My sharp ratio sucks because I'm a big game hunter in general. Um, I'm trying to answer the drawdown question. Mm -hmm. They're just, you have to understand that the method I use, we use works over long, long stretches. And you just have to keep getting in the water to catch these waves and you're going to screw a ton up. So if the pain isn't so bad, if you intrinsically understand that it's going to continue to work. Now, if you think it's a fluke or a one-off and you made this money and lost it or gave some back and now you're distressed because you don't believe, you've got to believe in the method and your ability to, to implement it and you you have to, see, it's so easy to say when I've been doing this for 30 years, but you, when you see the results over and over again, the first two or three times you do well, you're like, am, am I really doing this or is this a fluke? Was right. it off the market? And then you may get into a bad period and start to uh, discount your own ability. But over, long, over 30 years, this works, guys. If you follow this method, I mean, um, Ray, I think just said he was 26 you're going to get crazy rich by the time you're 60. If you just sit tight and deal, like implement consistently over time. If somebody came to me, if I came to myself today and said, Jim, what would you want to tell yourself going back 30 years? Just be patient and relax. These leaders are never going to stop coming. They, when I was first in the market, cell phones hadn't been invented. Okay, just let's go back and look at all the innovations that have transpired since then. Tesla was a, like Elon Musk was in high school, okay? I mean, these things are never going to stop coming. And now as long as the golden goose of capitalism remains the governing uh, body that we have in, in America or, or the world, free markets inspire humans to innovate and to elevate their position. It's in our nature to advance our position in life. And therefore, to be inventive and creative and to help everybody. I mean, think about the game changer a washing machine was. Most women spent like a third of their day or half the day doing laundry. The invention of the washing machine freed them up to do all these other things. Bicycles for people in third world countries. Let's just skip all that. The innovation is not going to stop coming. Be patient and compound your money yeah. without major drawdowns. Now, everyone's going to draw down. And what is acceptable to you may vary on, are you trying to build a war chest up? A 30% drawdown might be completely acceptable versus a, a person who's very long on in their career may say, I, I can't deal with a 15% drawdown. But that was, I took that so far afield. No, that's great. It's great. It's great. Um, here's a question about position sizing. Um, what 
what would you recommend um, for methods for smaller accounts? And I see that just popped up. So if you want to transition to that, that's cool too. Um, let's do this, please. Because now yeah, I want to get it. it. By the way, this has never, ever happened before. Go for it. No worries. This inventory to sales. Yeah. There's no inventory. Okay. We are in an economic boom. I mean, look at this chart, how dramatic that is. Um, let's go to job openings. People, this is, and I'm going to try to be very unpolitical, but people need to go back to work. Every, so many people, I was in Napa Valley uh, last week at a lot of great restaurants and half the tables are empty because they can't get staff in there. Mm -hmm. Cannot give people money and, and expect them to go to work. It just, and look at the job openings. Tell me there's not an economic explosion occurring here. Um, manufactured orders. Well, this one's a little deceiving, M2, but uh, we've never seen the monetary base expand like this ever in history, ever, ever, ever. So I'm looking, you know, it's not a shock why metals and things are really ripping. Uh, manufactured new orders. Hello. I mean, gentlemen, that is off the grid. It's going back to like 2000. It's never been this high. And it, look at the rate at which the, the Fed yeah. injected so much money into so many people's hands. We, we're going to have shortages. Like uh, what's going to happen come Christmas when people want to buy things? And let's go to uh, PPI. These are industrial commodities. Gentlemen, not a shocker why metal stocks are raging. And then the last one, this is really the showstopper. Wow. Just for one second, just, just take a look at that. You wonder why restoration hardware is going? I mean, it, it's even, it's hard to conceive. Look at the percentage move from eight to 46. And it did it in like six months. So make no doubt, this is the roaring 20s. This is possibly another Gilded Age moment until the bond market starts to say, bond buyers start to say, well, I don't want to buy bonds from anybody who's doing this with their monetary base. And I, that's why I kind of have a strong, um, well, I've liked crypto for the game-changing personality, the creative destruction there, but it's also like a safety valve if the Fed overcooks everything. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get all that out. I think these charts are historic. I don't know if we'll ever see them like this again. And so apply this to your investments and what you're selecting. But again, this is so, we're not the only ones who've looked at this, okay? It may largely be discounted, but you don't know how long this right. trip will last. Right. So there's a big 20 minute answer for you. No, that's perfect. Um, and getting back to the position sizing, I think that's a good question for especially the, the newer traders out there. Uh, what would you recommend um, for position sizing for smaller accounts, say less than 100K? If you're not using margin, you know, I would probably keep it around all, oh, less is always better. I don't want, ever want to have 12 stocks. Yep. Something between five and eight, it gives you chances to be, if, say you have a follow through day and you buy three, if all three don't work, you may want to add one more. So it's hard to strike out four in a row, yeah. especially in the beginning of a new move. You can, and, and you're, I've done this. I went on vacation with my family one time and I was out of the market and we had little kids and about the second or third day, we have a follow through day. And my wife's like, are you going to buy stock now? And I bought three and all three did not work. It was the beginning of a big bull market. This is like 10 or 15 years ago. So I made a rule where I have to buy four or try to buy four. So a minimum, a bare, bare minimum of four, and then a maximum of maybe eight. Mm -hmm. Give yourself the, my method, my rules. Most people have all these rules about getting out and it causes all this churn and turn. My rules are mostly about helping me stay in and giving a stock every opportunity to succeed. The more rules you have about getting, of cutting losses, I mean, other than the, the zero defect policy of, you know, three, five, seven, once you have a cushion, getting out of a monster that triples is a triple bogey. That's a ball in pocket. And I want to ask all your, everybody listening, mm -hmm. how many stocks have you sat with for over a year in your whole life? Because one of the biggest bogeys I see made is over trading 
churning yourself into oblivion, not having patience, dislodging life changers, you know, a giant leader because you made 10 grand or forget percentage wise, you're up 10, 15, 20%. Who cares? It's, I, you want to change your life. You want to get rich. You want to go from whatever. You want to go from skateboard to bike or bike to car or car to plane or plane to jet. You have to have life changers and you're going to make a lot of bogeys in between. But the rules that really make you rich are the ones that keep you in the ones that are going to triple. My net worth has come from probably like six or eight stocks complying over 30 years. All that crap in between, right? got stopped out and I got chopped up, up 10% or I freaked out over some crap. It just caused me grief. Rules to sit is what is going to make you rich. For sure. What was and, the position size? Yeah, the, the, the question size is like, how many positions do you think for, for an account of under 100K? But four to, four to, you said four to eight. So is that, is that kind of the good, yes. a good range? Yeah. And I see some questions here about three, five, seven. That's referring to your stop losses. And, and you definitely want to be out definitely before 7%, but ideally most of it before three and 5% losses. I think my average loss of a whole position is probably around four or 5%. It, you know, I will occasionally let something, the last remnant go to seven, but it's, it just doesn't, that's a special occasion. That occurs right. a couple of times a year, maybe. Right. And I probably, I'll tell you, I think I only will open new positions like 30 to 50 times in a year. Yeah. I mean, selectivity is the key. If you're just swinging at every single thing coming down the pike, you're going to make a million misses. You're going to be selective. Wait for like Livermore when Bethlehem Steel crosses 100. Just be patient and wait. They're, these monsters are never going to stop coming. But For if you're sure. looking at everything and you're looking all over the place, look at that, the squirrel, look at that one. It's, you know, and you're in all this crap and then the monster comes out. Focus on the real true liquid leaders if you want to make long-term monster gains. And that's how you get rich. It's hard. Think about how many 10 and 20% gains you need to make or earn to capture just one double or triple. Think about that. And all the mishits in between. Mm-hmm. So that's, I'm ready. No, no problem. No problem. Um, this is a question about uh, the earlier trading environment in 2021 when it got really choppy. Uh, so first of all, um, how did you treat approach that late February to mid May timeframe where growth stocks were showing minimal strength? And did you kind of rotate into commodities, value names, or did you just build out a larger cash position than normal? When stocks started getting weak, I was very late to sell. I was too much drinking the Kool-Aid of the prior year and my success and the leaders I was still in. But I did start to hedge a lot, selling in the money calls. And then it just seems like when things get really crummy and I start to feel it, I look back at my records and I, I'll, I'll, over a very short period of time, I'll let go 30, 40% of everything I have. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just because of the action and the way stocks are acting around the 50-day moving average. It's it's kind of it's very much like I call it the guardrail. Mm -hmm. If you if you just monitor your stocks and don't let them get too much below the 50, you're never really going to get in too much trouble. But don't ever let a break of the 50 on its own blow you out. You must monitor the volume through the break. How much far, how far below does it get? Does it get support? Mm -hmm. You can get three, four weeks tight right under the 50, which is a buy signal. Mm -hmm. So it's a guardrail with some subjectivity or ob you have to be objective about this. You can't just go breaks the 50. I'm gone. Mm -hmm. How does it break? Is it coming down like a glancing blow or is it just going like straight down? Right. So, you know, You'll also find that after really great periods in the market where your portfolio is ballooning up, you're about to have some really bad times. So I just follow the action. If you just follow the action around the 50, if you're not getting support on it, at it, or maybe within three, four, five percent of it, mm -hmm. you're getting it's it's trouble time. And um, were you just kind of sitting it out on the sidelines for the most part the last few months, or were you playing some of these commodity names that that were moving up? 
you know, I'm such a dogmatic person that I'm, I almost don't feel comfortable if the earnings growth isn't there. So when commodities turned up, I completely missed it. The market took off without me in the, in these, now I'm in XLE and OIH. And I think one of the greatest charts in the whole market, maybe that I've ever seen is GLD. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just let all that stuff go early on. And then it got, it's now extended. And so I'm reluctantly trying to work in there because it's one of the only areas that's working. And now oddly, we're starting to see like some crowd strikes and yeah. some other names trying to weekly eke out of semi-proper basis. Perfect. And um, there's a question here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I'm going to bring up a chart of pins. Uh, so I want to talk about one specific day. This this day right here, this huge upside reversal bar day where we saw this action in, in Snap, a lot of other growth leaders. So something kind of very different happened on that day. Uh, what are your thoughts about what occurred? Was it liquidity issue or whatever? Basically, how did you interpret that day? The, the, one, the one that you highlighted with the seat right there? Right there. Okay, that is a major signal to me. Now, yeah. the thing about methods is nothing works 100% of the time, but clearly some whale stepped in there and ran it back up. You always want to be keying in on this, especially one of the greatest signals is a gap down on earnings that closes up. Mm -hmm. That is very high probability. In this case, you it didn't work, but you now know somebody is in there who's a whale and they're supportive of it. I, I, you see this, you got, it must remain on your radar screen. And it may not, the general market's been crummy. Mm -hmm. So when things don't work, look at what the general market's doing, okay? Trouts, a trout cannot swim up Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. And right now, I mean, not that, Ni the market isn't like Niagara Falls, but for growth, it has been. Growth's been in a bear market, a real one, not a pseudo one, but it's been masked because the indexes are, have been supported by other names, other sectors. Right. So you you viewed that day where we also saw the same similar action in the stock like apps, where it's really, it, it seemed to kind of start the wide and loose action that we are seeing in the market, but you viewed these big upside reversals as supportive action. They're major, major signals. Now they, they, these didn't work. Yeah. That's fine. If you, then that's not a buy signal. Well, it's almost a buy signal in itself. I would like to see it have bre breached its downtrend first, but mm -hmm. th those are huge clues. Skyscrapers mm -hmm. of volume on a reversal mm -hmm. is even bigger than a gap up, I think. Gotcha. All right, um, going, getting back to just some normal questions. Let me bring that up. Um, what are some current themes that you are focused on in the stock market right now? I'm trying not to tell the market where it's going. Yeah. But there's something up with metals and gold. And I look, I always try to build the case for what's happening, not the case for what's going to happen. And the case right now is the Fed's balance sheet is going off the rails and gold is ripping. Growth has been ill. I'm, I'm not really super sanguine. Now I can change my mind really fast. If a couple more of these growth stocks come out, I'm going to, I could by Wednesday, I could have completely changed my position. Yeah. But right now, um, I, I'm very interested in what's happening with gold. And, and I don't like these names. I'm an optimist. I don't want to see gold going up at all or basing and forming a really good pattern. Yeah. So I love the security. I love crypto uh, security stocks like internet security. Yeah. Um, what are my themes? Anything with monster earnings growth, like some of these stocks like Zscaler and CrowdStrike, their earnings didn't slow down at all. Yeah. They're, so that, and I don't like PE ratios, but as these earnings are ramping and these stocks are going sideways to down, they're getting cheaper. And I don't think there's going to be a end to an, for a need. Look at, if you're the work from home disaster recovery type theme, if you and I are CEOs, co-CEOs, and we now know what possibly could happen and we have to set this up and we don't, if it happens again, we're fired. So right now we're allocating significant amounts of our budget to make sure our jobs are safe. 
that's a major theme. Um, come back to me. You kind of caught me off guard. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we can move on. So um, how do you build out conviction when positioning into a single name? Is it purely fundamental and then technical entry areas? The power of the breakout, the beauty of the base, the elegance and symmetry of it is going to give me a lot of confidence. Yeah. But when you go to the store or you drive a Tesla and you now, if you, if I would ask Bill, how do I, what, which ones do you sit through earnings on? And Bill's like, well, how convicted are you? Do you have a cushion? If you use the product, if you gone and uh, counted cars in the parking lot, fund, this is ultimately technicals corroborate the fundamentals. They should, they have to corroborate each other. They right. both have to be in harmony. And no matter what, I'm going to tell a simple story. <clears throat> I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard it. There's an old time research analyst and he hires a rookie mm. and the rookie comes in and he says, Hey rookie, write me a report on general motors. And the rookie goes, well, do you want a bearish report or a bullish report? There's always a bear case in a bull case, right? But the only case that matters is the one that corroborates the up or the down trend. Cause that's what the market believes right now. Richard, if you told me, Jim, I've identified a company that is minting million dollar gold bars for 30 cents and it's publicly listed. I'd go, well, it doesn't matter if institutions don't believe it. If it's in a downtrend and those fundamentals are true, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is do institutions believe it? Are they supporting it and running it up? Perfect. And um, probably a lot of traders earlier this year went through a little bit of a drawdown. They, they, they maybe had some trouble. They lost confidence in, this, in themselves a little bit. Um, Personally, how do you recover from a period like that where you're going through a rut? How do you psychologically kind of shift your focus back to what's working and get your mind right and, and be ready to capitalize on the next uptrend? You never stop watching the charts, but in moments like this, so say you do your chart work, yeah. read Livermore's book again, read Bill's book again, read, um, read the books because being a student of history and understanding market cycles and the leaders in every cycle will give you the confidence to know that it's going to happen again. Even if you, let's say you didn't just, let's say you had a bit, let's say you blew your account up mm -hmm. because you're a rookie and you're just learning, recapitalize, regroup, get more discipline. And no, when you reread these, I get so excited when I read these books, I have to put them down because I know what's going to happen. Knowing what's going to happen just fills you full of confidence. I mean, how many times do you have to see a Motorola or, I mean, dude, over the last 150 years, the names that have come out and changed the world were almost every one of them was a listed company. It's not going to stop. So if you bungled it, clearly rectify what rule you broke mm -hmm. and then look at yourself and say, why didn't I follow the rules? What's going on with me? Get your psychological house in order and then read history about the market, read market history. It, see, I, I think the reason this has worked for me is because I, I get excited about it. Like a lot of people would go, you're a geek, dude. You are a chart dork. I mean, that's why, that's why I'm confident about it. Yeah. Well, do you want to go through some charts? Because uh, I think it'd be great to talk about some leaders you're currently looking at, kind of uh, what's on your radar right now. So I must acknowledge, I but just- You might have to share your screen. Uh... Okay. I just came off a three-day um, golf tournament, so my, um, and I do all my big research on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So what I'm just going to do is go through my alert window, and I'll tell you something else. I don't know if you guys all have access to this, but IBD's um, homepage, basically, this is the most valuable part of Wanda right here. Can you see the arrow? Mm -hmm. See volume percentage change? Yep. I know from the second the market opens, what stock is up on volume from the second it opens. And I have most of the market leaders in here. And so I just go down the list. Like I, we'll talk about gap up on volume. I bought this on the gap up. When I see volume like that coming out on a drug. Now, look, it could have been this day too, right? Mm -hmm. here, okay. On the, on the 4th of November, but I'm willing to take that risk. This is a, like, you know, he said the volume reversal day. These are, I would, I'll tell you this, of the money I've made, gap up breakouts that are insane, mm -hmm. 
which most people are petrified of, have made me a ton of money. And most people were not buying this up. What do you, um, yeah, it closed up price change 38% of the day on 17, uh, on 18 million shares when average, average daily volume is like a million. Yeah. That is a monster signal. And then at the same time, there's a lot of news saying, well, the drug is ambivalent, whether it really works or not. And it's a, a limp, it's a, uh, an approval that is tacit where it, it, they, it's dependent on more data. Yeah. The, who's the dummy? The guys who are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into here or the, or the news reporter jumping up and down, well, I'm not sure about the drug. Follow the money. So I love, I don't love it, but I like it. Um, this is a stock I hedged a lot. And so all through here, you know, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, the top here. But when it broke the 50 and it actually came down, actually, I was hedging all these extensions also up in here. Mm -hmm. um, when it broke the 50 through here, I was hedging because I didn't want to get rid of it because I didn't have the long-term gain. But the sim I'm going to answer this uh, hedging strategy. Yeah. Anytime a stock gets historically above a moving average or to a point where if it corrected back to the moving average where you'd feel big pain, you have to hedge 30, 40, 50, 60% of it. Now, after the first breakout, the personality of that stock is likely changing. So you're likely to see greater levels of extension than before a breakout. So you have to be, don't hedge all or nothing. You work your way into your hedge. Say you hedge off 20%, the more it extends, 30 for the high, the greater the level of extension, the more you, ex, the more you hedge. Um, but this is now kind of turning up on volume. They're talking about their handset uh, applications. Um, so we'll skip through Zoom. I think this, what I think doesn't matter, but it, it, it shouldn't matter. But if you don't have conviction, if GameStop goes to 5,000 and I don't have conviction, I will get shaken out. I think this is a shell game. And I don't want anything to do with it. Um, let's see here. Okay, here's one that I do like. This is a stock that is talking to you. This volume move, um, price is up 16% for the day. You know, volume was up 586%. And I showed you the retail sales chart. Yeah. Okay, people are investing in their homes. Home sales are exploding. People are decorating them. It all makes sense to me. And... Yeah, their earnings were, revenue was up 78% on a 285% earnings gain. Mm -hmm. Boom. I mean, that is monstrous. Um, I'm going down here. And I, Jim, actually, can we go back to the hedging uh, process for just a second? Certainly. Um, and maybe bring up, uh, yeah, if you want to talk about TTD, can you talk about the, the specifics you do, the, the strike price, the, the methods, all of that? Um, that would be great. Okay, I like options that are gonna, the closer you get to the uh, expiration, the more rapidly time depreciates. I yep. always wanna be short time, I do. Look, options are a loser's game. I don't, you know how they say at the casino, well, the house has like a three or 4% edge on 21. That's true, but most people walk out broke, okay? Yep. And they say, well, options, you know, four out of five expire worthless. Well, that is true for the pro, but for the rookie, it's more like 20 out of 30 go to zero, okay? So I'm short time. And the closer to the expiration, I want to be short no more than two weeks. And I just look at where's the 50-day. Mm -hmm. And so I'll pick a strike 5% below the 50-day and sell that for the ex next expiration or, or a week or two out. And when it gets – now, here's the trickier part. When it gets down there, is it about to blow up completely and come undone? Or is it just going to catch support? So you have to watch it very, very carefully. And how is it acting if you, if you were correct and it goes to the strike? And now something that caught me by surprise was some of these that I hedged blew through my strike and I didn't roll them out fast enough to a lower strike to protect myself. Yeah. So if you've got, this is, it's work. It's not easy. You have to be on this. It's not like set it and let it go. You have to monitor it. So Within two weeks expiration, 5% below the 50-day-ish. Um, 
and it, it and you leg into it and I leg out of them. I almost never just go sell a thousand by, you know, buy whatever I, I, I work into it. I, I used to hedge only because I was so bullish all the time. Yep. I would only hedge 30%. And it's just not enough to sit through a 20, 25% correction is for me. So I now think you need to hedge when it gets really extended 50, 40, 50, even 65. Depends on how conservative you are. Yeah. But I don't ever hedge at all because it could get into a climax run. Right. And I don't want to give up those possibilities. Perfect. And did you implement this with uh, TDoc or Tesla last year uh, when, when, they, when they started breaking the key moving averages? Definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. But Teladoc, I think I actually just kind of got out of. I, yeah. that's, long, that's been long gone. It just never really, after it worked phenomenally. Yeah. But also when Trump would come on and go, well, we're going to implement, uh, you know, he would talk about Teladoc. I would sell into that sometimes because it just, it would run 15 points on his news conference. Mm-hmm. I would sell little bits of it, five five percent. Perfect. So. Um, and do you want to bring up Tesla and talk about how you've handled that one? Because I'm sure everybody has that on their minds. Okay. I think the I, I will talk about that, but I think the much more important thing is sure. This is the leader of the market. And the, when I first became a broker in 1987, the old guys in the office would go, "As General Motors goes, so goes the market," and they were right. It just so happens that at this moment, another auto manufacturer is the dominant player. It's the market cap. It's the liquid leader. It has captivated everyone's attention and it is holding the 200 day. But in general, this is a no-go zone. Okay. It's like the crazy hot matrix. This is the no-go zone. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, You know, until this breaks 780, you've got a big overhead. It's kind of like I showed you the chart of Zoom. It's turning up, but it... Who knows? It may, I mean, like t- Trade Desk tried to turn up a couple of times. It got murdered back down. It's kind of like this, um, ARKK. Until ARK breaks 130, growth is in, you know, stay in cash, look at other areas, go play golf, go enjoy your life. There's so much more to the world than your life than just trading. But back to Tesla, I, you know, I wish Eve was here. Because she really stayed with it. She bought the car. Um, I missed, I think, most of this whole last blow-off move. I was just focusing on other things. I was not paying enough attention. I did way better with Tesla down here and up in here. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me go to the weekly. Yeah. I was in down here and sold this blow-off. Yeah. And when that happened... I never thought it would come back. I thought it was cooked because I did a study. My study of say the last 70 years of leaders, my numbers say only 3.7% of leaders repeat. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, ah, you know, 90, 96% chance it's not coming back. I was done, finished with it. But then I did reload in here, ran with it hard. And I sold into this climax again. And that was it. I let it go. I, I, I completely missed the, the last half of the monster run. Um, I think the biggest point I learned is never say never. You, you, you just don't know. Like Cisco Systems was a stock similar to this back in the yeah. 90s where, and I, I, I'm so off tangent, talking about autos and stocks never say never. Joe Kernan comes on CNBC. This was before I was in this house. So it was 20 years ago. And he goes, can you believe Cisco Systems valuation is higher than General Motors? And GM goes to zero, goes to bank, goes bankrupt. And what did Cisco do? It went up 5X. So never, when you see a real base that's, that's genuine and tightening up, like it's tightening up right in here. Look, your opinion means nothing, Joe Kernan. (laughs) The stock is what matters. So... I made a bogey on it. How about, how did I handle that? I handled it really well the first two runs and then the last one, I completely fumbled it. Yeah. I didn't even pay yeah. attention to it. Yeah, you got a nice move out of, out, out of it though. Um, right. I, want, I want to talk to you about crypto a little bit because I, I know that's a focus of yours as well. Um, first of all, how have you handled the, the recent pullback and, and how, are you, how are you looking at things in general? Is it, are the charts setting up again or is this a bear flag down there? 
I think they're setting up again. Um, and I will show you. I think, okay, th this is, this is, this is a pet stock of our pet coin of mine. Cause I was in on the private placement, but let's just go to the big dogs. This when here, look at my uptrend. Now my uptrend line has broken, mm -hmm. but we really haven't broken this low right here. Mm -hmm. And this is a very supportive day. This is the 19th. I think this was tax day, uh, whatever. This is the day crypto just blew wide open. Yeah. But it closed very high in the range, very high. And the volume was fantastic. Then we come down when Bitcoin came down hard again, it did not even come close. Relatively much, much stronger. Runs like crazy. And then boom, we have another breakdown and another very high, that's in the top 25% of that bar, and the volume's huge again. Mm -hmm. So now we undercut last night. Volume was no big deal, but it closed mid-range. And this is kind of a critical moment right here. We'll see if it holds. But this is, this is borderline um, a minor bull uh, ascending triangle. So I, I'm much more bullish on Ether at this minute, but Bitcoin's been coming around now. Mm -hmm. Look at these supportive days. Okay, look at this massive volume support day. Another massive shakeout. Now remember, the futures are huge in Bitcoin. They're no, mm -hmm. not, nowhere near so in ETH. That's why I think the deleveraging whipped Bitcoin much, much harder. Now, as this all evolves, that futures volume is going to spread out. But that's why I think this got hit so darn hard. This is a bad day. Um. You know, and I say Gandhi, Mother Teresa days, Gandhi days. Mother Teresa went into a Dunkin' Donuts one day, was pissed, and yelled at the guy behind the counter. She is not perfect. She's human. Stocks have bad days, and it doesn't mean they're, they're disasters. It's Everybody has bad days. If Mother Teresa and Gandhi can have a bad day, Bitcoin can have a bad day. You can have a bad day on volume. It does not mean it's blown out. Mm -hmm. So, again, you come down. It's not a lower low. You have a lower low, volume picks up, it closes to the dead high. And so you see my, my alert lines right here. Yep. So that's what, 39.5. And then uh, you, go, you get through 40,900. 40, I don't mean by 50 points. <laughs> you get 3% three, 3 over that and it stays there. Mm -hmm. It's on. <laughs> I'm bullish on crypto. Very yep. bullish especially with the backdrop I showed you M2. Mm -hmm. At what point do central banks or investors say central banks have overdone it? Right. Now, I, I felt that way in when Europe started a quantitative ease and it screwed me up for two years. I have learned that central banks can keep the balls juggling in the air far longer than anyone, anyone thinks. Mm -hmm. But you have a limited supply of Bitcoin. 21 million coins is all it'll ever be. People are going, for, go, going to go for security as the dollar devalues, as currencies around the world devalue. Forget about the utility of Ethereum and the blockchain and how I believe everything to do with money is going to be disintermediated by crypto. I mean, everything. And I think people barely understand that. I understand it in a cursory fashion. But the general public has no clue. They think mm -hmm. like PayPal and Venmo is crypto. <laughs> they have no clue. How about that for a 20-minute answer to a one sense question? No, that's perfect. And actually, if you go back and, and share Wanda, I want to talk through some more charts and, and talk about some, some potential leaders here, Roblox, NVIDIA, and see how you're interpreting everything. Um, I own Roblox, mm -hmm. RLX, but I own it. So there was a big debate in my little hedge fund managers group and with Eve, whether this was a base yeah. or whether it was a good base. Now, if you look at volume accumulation, if Bill was here, Bill would just draw circles around. He'd be like, oh my God, look at this, look at this, look at this. But I think he would also be going, this is choppy. This is not tight. And Bill really, really cir circled tight areas on charts. I, on this day, bought it almost at the, at the, at the close. I wait mm -hmm. until the very end of the day to see if the support remains throughout the day, but that volume just got me in there. And so if you look at the sales growth is ripping. I mean, it's not just ripping, it's accelerating. 
mm -hmm. significantly. And the inst and this is also one major, inst I think Bill Miller has taken a position here. Now his results are pretty erratic, but he's a legendary investor. You, you, when he does something, you have to pay attention. So now we've got one big institution in, at, at least that we know about, you've got the volume accumulation, and this is in a crap market for growth. If you can pick one or two of the first monsters out, or sorry, stocks out around a follow through date or a turn in the cycle of growth, mm -hmm. you are possibly on a giant leader. Mm -hmm. So if the, you know, how we saw Zoom come up and crowd strike and all these things, I haven't done my research today. So you're kind of catching. No, me. all good. All good. But this could be huge. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very bullish on that. And the demographic they're reaching yeah. is kind of hard to get, you know, for advertisers to get their hands on. This is really lucrative thing. And I, I want to talk about NVIDIA. Go for it. I debated this with myself ad nauseum. The market's crap. This looks good. The handle. And I was, okay, so I drew the black line in here. And I said, you've got, you have such a tiny little digestion here. And the market's not really in gear. So I let it go. I am in bad periods. I think what saves my ass is I'm very, very dogmatic and expect perfection. In great markets, I'm willing to loosen up my criteria. But if you listen to Bill speak, I saw Bill, I, I probably went to he hear Bill address me uh, like uh, rooms like possibly 70 times and I recorded every one. And when you re-listen to these ta uh, tapes, he talks about perfection and bases. He does not talk about four weeks base. He talks about all the critical things. And all these people are running around there buying all, this is, we should have a conversation about alternative pivot points versus real bases. Mm -hmm. And this is my opinion. If you're starting full positions on alternative pivot points, you're asking to be kicked in the teeth, over trade and, 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 and draw down. Okay. If Bill wants to start a monster position at the beginning of a new bull cycle out of a big full 10 to 15 week base, not two weeks tight or 20 seconds tight. All right, those are ads once you've established a great position and the value of a cushion, you cannot overstate the value of a cushion. You can mm -hmm. deal with drawdowns, but if you're selling things up 10%, 20%, you're never going to have a cushion. You're living on a razor's edge. Your life is a mess. Cause you're like, ah, um, you know, I'm like that. I'm like that without cushion, with cushion. <laughs> Imagine what I'd be like without it. So anyway, I think, this was, it proved to work. Yeah. And so a lot of times I will sometimes let a monster go to prove to me the market is going to work. And then I can be more confident in the next ones that come out. And then I'll try to figure out how to get into this. But this is then caught more volume after the, after it yeah. came out. So it's continuing to be supported. And this is just a really long base with kind of like two cups in the end of it. But what I really want to skip to is so just put your finger on the chart. And now I put up Amazon. Amazon looks just like NVIDIA before NVIDIA came out. It's true, it's true. Now, if this comes out and this, um, and this pops out, you know, there's possibilities here. Okay. I'm not, like I said, I'm in some of the, I am in GLD. I'm kind of a mixed bag. I have Roblox. I have Biogen. I have GLD or GDX, OIH and XLE. But by Wednesday, I could have 50% of my account in growth stocks. And I, yeah. I, I am a dimmer switch. I'm not going to go flop that account and move all that money in, in a day. I'm just not. I, I, we have a rule. In our mm -hmm. shop, we say you cannot alter your total allocation by more than 30% in a day. It keeps you from getting overly optimistic on one big up day, which could fail, or too pessimistic on one any one big down day and dislodge your leaders. Now, as rules-based as we are, or I am, you know, that takes the, a lot of fear and greed out of it. 
there are special occasions. Mm -hmm. Special occasions are not once a day or once a week or once a month. They're once or twice a year, maybe. When you have a climax run and sometimes you'll get a climax run in three of your five stocks in, in one or two days, I could go from 130% long to 40% long. But how often do you have four stocks climax run within two days? How many, how, how many times per cycle? Right. So let's not confuse rules with special occasions. They're really, really rare. So you said NVIDIA and Roblox. What else you want to talk about? Um, well, first of all, I want to ask you, is there any other potential you, you think like top three stocks in the market that you want to talk about? Let me read um, my notes. Or we could look at CrowdStrike, Zscaler, which are kind of moving up the right-hand side, had some earnings gaps there. I think um, GNRC is more of a chugger and a steady growth, but I yeah. completely understand the fundamentals of the decentralization of our power grid and why that is so excellent for our country. So, because the energy transmission is terrible, we lose 30% of energy through transmission. We're susceptible to terrorism through the grid. It's just, a and the rolling blackouts of California and government stupidity. Generac makes so much sense to me for a thousand reasons. Um, okay, I like, first of all, I pass on almost everything. Yep. But I think AMAT has some tight action. Now, listen, I didn't even look at it on Friday. Mm -hmm. So this is blown up. Okay, look at how tight that is. Yeah. Let's redraw this. All right, that is, now this has the semblance of a, of a solid base. Let's see if the weekly corroborates. This bad volume day week right here is mm -hmm. actually closing in the higher area. This is kind of what Lee Freestone would point out to me. I think this looks very good. And I love this tight action in here. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Tesla. Now, Tesla had weeks and weeks of it. This is yeah. only about three weeks of it. This is very interesting. Let me fly back to my notes really quick. You know, this is a, okay, Yeti is a very small stock. Yeah. And I cannot understand why people are paying so much money for coolers. Like you can go to Walgreens, get the knockoff. But look, women buy purses for 20, 20 grand and they can put their, uh, their, their toiletries in a, in a paper bag. They want that logo. Maybe the guys need the ego with the football game. I don't know, but I don't understand. Um, so it's better that I don't participate in Yeti. Mm -hmm. And also this is a symptom of the general mark. Can, you are looking at the Yeti chart. Yep, right? I'm, I'm seeing the same thing. So it hops out right here. But growth is not ready. So it just tests your patience, test your patience, test your patience. And then it bangs out. What was that last Monday? Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting to me. Market cap is 8 billion. It's, it's reasonable. Um, Look at those earnings. Let's see. I know. But you know, I, that's really what I want to talk about. Because I yeah. did make some notes on earnings. The earnings on APPS... Look at this, guys. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this is really once a cycle type numbers. Now, the stock is clearly not ready. It's a mess up here. This company is continuing to power ahead. And then this, this is the Mac Daddy of the earnings story. Guys, this is, I mean, how often do you see a 1,000%? This is like what Amgen did when they invented the red blood cell replenisher. Just imagine chemotherapy, you have AIDS. It's a game changer when you can increase your white blood cells. They put up 32 cents against a penny and it kicked off one of the biggest rallies I've ever seen in my life. I was a brand new broker back then. That's the kind of numbers you see here. Now this has had a big, big digestion. No reason that this cannot come out again. Um, people don't want to go back to work. I mean, I saw this uh, part, uh, a segment on TV, well, this woman said, I've been working from home. They called me back into work for a five minute meeting. That is over. Those days are over. We, I mean, remote, remote work is here to stay. Now people are going to have to go in sometimes, but yeah. anyway, I'm getting very carried away. You want to see, look at these earnings is what I'm trying to point out. Yeah. Um, GNRC. I mean, what is up with this Bentley systems? Okay. So <laughs> this group has been a mess. And this stock breaks out at 52 and runs while well, growth's been terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they do, but I need to do some research and figure this out because that, that's very unusual behavior. And 
the volume bars, it's just, those are just walls of blue on the daily. I like walls of blue better on weekly, but they're there, there. Yeah. This is very, very interesting to me. Um, hold on. Zoomers. Okay. Nobody really talks about this anymore. Mm -hmm. The CEO owns 21% of this whole company. <laughs> You can rest assured management is on it. Yeah. And again, now these earnings are so elite, elite, elite. And it did try to come out last Friday. It has a little overhead supply volume kind of came in, but again, we are now getting into the dog or dog days of summer. Yeah. So although I want volume, there's a lot of people in the Hamptons and there's a lot of people playing uh, in golf tournaments. So maybe you won't quite get what we are going to need as far as volume. If you bought some of this on Friday, I think that's just fine. But the real action is going to take, take, uh, take a, occur over 230 if the general market gets in gear. Right. It's, it's kind of like if you know a stock's going to earn 50 cents this year and they're going to earn $15 next year, if the market turns up, that is going to rip. Right. So you, we do need the general market to help participate. Um, is there any other stacks you want me to cover specifically? Uh, nothing specific, but I do have a question about earnings and estimates and stuff. How closely are you watching those earning estimates and the, especially the revisions to the kind of 2020 leaders like Zoom, Peloton, uh, because some, some of them have completely fallen off the cliff while others are actually getting revised upwards. So are you looking at that at all? I don't just look at it. It's imperative. It's mm -hmm. part of the matrix that I use, you know, is, you know, Zach's, the, mm -hmm. the Zach's built their whole business on earnings beat and raise and re earnings revision. It's critical. It, it, listen, why do stocks go up? Well, there's new information. They thought the company was going to earn a dollar. They earned a dollar 50. Well, that's a surprise. The stocks the price must adjust. And the cockroach theory completely applies here. Yeah. I mean, when you're in college, you're looking at a, a, a condo or whatever, and you see one cockroach come out from the counter. There's probably five or 10 more of that counter. Earnings beats are the same. Yeah. And the definition of making your first cornerstone and getting rich is sitting through four to five to six earnings beats. That's a game changer. That is a light that will take you from one station of life to the next. Yeah. But how many people will sit through five earnings reports? How many people will even sit for? I'm going to guess that of the people listening to this, over 50% of them have never held a stock for a year. I, I'll go 70%. How the hell are you going to change your life if you are not holding these things? These stocks are going up 100, 200, 300%. And they're going right between your fingers. You're churning yourself to death. And I am inconsistent. My results, I'm not, I'm not just a linear go up like this. I compounded out over 20 or 30 years because I caught a, a, a monster every three years. And I was, I stayed with the process through these bad periods. And I did millions of dumb things in these bad periods. I went through this horrible period when I thought the ECB was going to liquidate the world with too much cash. And I, I didn't give up. I redoubled my efforts. Um, let's go to the next stock. Uh, well, actually, unfortunately, I think we've just pretty much run out of time, but I want to end it uh, with one last question. What advice do you have for everybody watching to maybe pump them up, get them ready for the next, uh, uptrend and all of that. I'll make you one guarantee. As long as capitalism perseveres, there will be innovators in garages right now. They don't care. They're trying to fix the next problem. They're going to need money. They're going to come public. It's going to make a perfect base. They're going to have monster numbers. It's going to make a new high. The relative strength is going to be there. It's going to happen over and over and over and over and over again. It's never going to stop. So forget about this rough period we had. It's just a shred of time. I guarantee, I will guarantee nothing but this. There's going to be more monster leaders and opportunities for everyone listening to change your station in life, whether that's from a one-bedroom condo to a $50 million house or just retirement for security. Whatever you want in life that you need monetarily, the market will give it to you if you're patient and disciplined. It's a guarantee you can do it. If I did it, a dyslexic kid could do this with horrible grades could do this. Anybody can do it. Go for it.
Perfect. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. I'm sure um, everybody who's watching appreciates it as well. Um, and with that, uh, we'll take a quick 15-minute uh, break and then come back with Chris Peruna. So stay tuned. Thanks, guys. Thank you.